Let's take our Bibles today, be turning to the Gospel of Mark, and we'll be in Mark chapter 11 in just a moment. Mark chapter 11. We'll kind of review just a little bit because it's been a couple of weeks since we were here in Mark 11, but uh, kind of refresh our memories for those of your guests today, and it's good to have you with us. Uh, on Sunday mornings, we've been going verse by verse, uh, chapter by chapter through this great book, the Gospel of Mark, and uh, enjoying the journey of Jesus, and he's getting in this passage closer and closer to the time, of course, that he will go to Calvary's cross and suffer and die for our sins. And so very important moment in history. Mark chapter 11, and um, if you're able to stand, let's stand together for the reading of the Word of God before we get into the message. If you're not able to stand, of course, we understand that. Just to look back here in, in last week's lesson, in verse 11, we find Jesus as he entered into Jerusalem. This is his final entrance or his visit to Jerusalem. It'd be more than one visit in and out of the city. He went into the temple, it says in verse 11, and when he looked round about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, he went out into Bethany with the twelve. So he stayed there, he investigated, he surveyed the area, and he went back to Bethany, a little village about three miles outside of Jerusalem. Verse 12 says, and on the morrow, and this is important to our Lesson today, on the morrow when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. There were no figs on the tree, only leaves. Verse 14, and Jesus answered and said unto it, to the fig tree, no man eat free fruit of thee hereafter forever. No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever, and his disciples heard it. They continued their journey, verse 15, into Jerusalem. I'll just read one verse of this uh, time of his visit there about his uh, overturning the tables of the money changers. Verse 15, they came to Jerusalem. And Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. We talked about that. That was our subject last time we were in this passage. Verse 19 said, And when he was come, when even was come at the end of the day, it's evening time, he went out of the city, went back to Bethany. Now verse 12, and this is the passage we'll be really focusing on today. And in the morning... The next morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. This was only one day previous that Jesus spoke that curse upon the fig tree. One day's gone by and he's, Peter's amazed by what he sees. Verse 22, and Jesus answering, saith unto them, have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father forgive, excuse me, your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Great passage of scripture. And we're going to look at this today and get us a few Bits of inspiration and assistance from the Lord. Some lessons from a fig tree. Let's pray as we begin. Father, thank you for your word today. We pray you'd bless as we study it. Lord, give us open minds, hearts, attentive minds to your word. Help us to avoid distractions. Keep ourselves focused. Help me 
Lord, just to simply proclaim what you've already said in your word, we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much. I want to begin with this uh, first part of this passage, which has to do with the cursing of the fig tree and the cause that Jesus cursed the fig tree. And it was very simply this, it was the absence of fruit. You know, when Jesus said in verse 14 of chapter 11, when Jesus spoke to that fig tree, he says, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. The last sentence we emphasized when we had this uh, previous lesson and his disciples heard it. They took special note when Jesus said this. I mean, uh, Jesus didn't normally go around talking to trees and he speaks this curse to this tree and says, you'll never bear fruit again. So the next morning in verse 20, 24 hours later, when they come back, they see this tree, the Bible says, dried up from the roots. It's only been one day. Jesus cursed the tree, but it's already dead. Not just, you know, normally, you know, if you'll pay attention to trees, they don't usually die like this. They die gradually. They die with a few dead leaves. Maybe a few limbs drop, drop off this year and a few more next year. But this was entirely Different. This thing is already dead, completely dead, instantly dead, obviously dead, noticeably dead. And so Peter spoke for the disciples in verse 21, and he spoke to Jesus about this and said, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. The word behold indicates an element of surprise. Master, do you realize what has happened to that fig tree? As a matter of fact, when Matthew records it in his gospel, his first words out of Peter's mouth were, What? What happened here? What exactly transpired? This tree, and it's almost like he's surprised and he thinks Jesus ought to be surprised. This tree that you cursed is withered away. We're going to spend some time today looking at this incredible event, really an unusual event. Event. It was a miracle. Now these disciples had seen many miracles. But one of the things that made this miracle unique was most of his miracles were constructive. Uh, they were repairing things. They were improving things. But this was a destructive miracle. A miracle that destroyed this tree, cursed the tree. It immediately died. So the question is, why? Why did Jesus curse this tree? tree. By the way, fig trees like olive trees are quite common in Israel. Uh, I was reading this week about when the spies went into the Canaan land, the land that once they occupied became the nation of Israel. When the spies went into the, into the, in the Old Testament time into Canaan to survey the land, one of the things they talked about when they came back and gave the report was the abundance of figs. Figs everywhere. So it's very common for figs to be in Israel. When Jesus saw this fig tree, he noticed it had leaves. Now we would think that's not a very big deal, but it was was for Jesus because he cursed it. He was hungry. He saw this fig tree. It had leaves. He goes to check it out to get some fruit, but it had none. The Bible says, we read this earlier in verse 13, I think, it says, and having a, seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. Notice this phrase, for the time of figs was not yet. This was, this was really early in the season for there to be figs. So it wasn't the normal time that fig trees would be bearing fruit, but it had leaves. And so here's an interesting fact about fig trees. There are several interesting facts about fig trees. I'll reserve some of them. But an interesting fact about fig trees is they bear fruit, different from most trees we're aware of, they bear fruit before the leaves mature. Normally the leaves are fully grown and developed and obvious, and then comes the fruit. But not so in the fig tree. So uh, they they bear fruit before the leaves are full. It wasn't time. That's why it says there. I think it's an interesting verse in verse um, 13 when it says the time of figs was not yet. It wasn't time for figs to be ripe. But on this particular tree, unlike the other fig trees, the leaves were full. If the leaves were full, you would expect 
that the fruit would be there. Does that make sense to you? So this, this is what makes this such an interesting event. The fig tree had leaves, but no fruit. And Jesus cursed the tree for that reason. Because, why? Because its appearance was deceptive. A tree with leaves should have already produced fruit. In essence, the barren tree was a symbol of hypocrisy, of looking like you're something when in reality you're not. Now, we'll, look, we'll talk about this in a moment as we further into the message, but the fig tree was really symbolic of the spiritual condition of Israel because that's what they were. They were a religious institution that appeared to have a relationship with God, but in reality, as a whole, they had no relationship with God. We'll come back to that later. Jesus cursed this tree, and it's not just, though, a lesson, I don't think, for just for Israel. It's a, it's a lesson for all of us about this matter of our fruit. Not just what we say, but what we are. In Matthew chapter 7, I'm not going to turn to it, but Matthew chapter 7, Jesus addressed this numerous times. He said, for instance, in that passage, by their fruits you shall know them. In that same passage, Jesus said, false prophets will come to you in sheep's clothing. If you look at them, they look like a sheep. They have sheep's clothing, but Jesus said inside there's something else. Jesus said they're ravening wolves. They're, they're looking like one thing on the outside when inside there's something else. In that same passage, Jesus said, Every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. In that same passage in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down. If it's not producing good fruit, it's cut down. And then he said this again, by their fruits you shall know them. Jesus cursed this tree because its leaves indicated that it had fruit, but there was no fruit. And you know what? People can be just like that. We could all be like that. We appear to be religious on the outside, but without genuine fruit. We can have a profession but not be possessing life, not be fruit-bearing. And a profession without fruit is cursed. There's no life there. Let me say this to all of us. We're not about, our life is not about just trying to make ourselves look good on the outside. It ought to be about what's really on the inside. It doesn't do any good to profess to be religious if there's no fruit. I think this is an important lesson, not just for Israel, but for all of us. Jesus cursed this tree, and when he did, he pronounced its destruction. As I said earlier, there's a national illustration in this about Israel. But as we look at it, there's individual implications. You know, I've known many people in my Christian life that have made a profession of faith at some point in their time and said, I'm saved. Maybe they go to church, maybe they carry a Bible, whatever, but on, it's only later in life that they realized, you know, I don't really have a relationship with God. And the good thing about many of these people is they're willing to humble themselves, acknowledge that, turn to Christ, receive the gift of eternal life, and then they don't just have something that looks right on the outside, they have something that's real on the inside. And, you know, you could be like that today. Maybe you're sitting here today and you're thinking, you know, I've, I've been to church, I've been religious, you know, but I don't really know that I have a relationship with God. If you don't have a relationship with God, there's not going to be any real spiritual fruit in your life. And so Jesus cursed this fig tree for that reason. If a person has a life that looks like leaves as they this fruit tree did a religious appearance but without fruit they're doomed you know what spiritual fruit is spiritual fruit is the manifestation of the divine life that's in us when we get saved and if your life is a life without fruit then you need the lord you ought to ask yourself does this describe me am i is this about where i am if you are, maybe you're living a lie. I've said this many times over the years of preaching. I think one of the most miserable 
existence as there could be is for a person trying to live like a Christian who's not really a Christian. <laughs> because it's all trying to put something on, act like something. This, again, I go back to Israel. Israel was a religious nation. They were known for their religion. Their whole religion or their whole nation, national identity revolved around their religion, around the temple and their worship in Jerusalem. But they had no relationship with God. Their religion was just pretense. So now, first of all, we talked about the absence of fruit. The second thing I want to talk about, though, is the nation of Israel. Because throughout the Bible, Old Testament and even New Testament, the fig tree is used to symbolize Israel. You may have never thought of it when you was reading about it. Jeremiah, for instance, one of the Old Testament prophets, he, he wrote about Judah the nation of Judah, the southern part of the kingdom, and how they were like two baskets of figs. One basket represented those who would obey. One basket of figs represented those who would disobey. Jesus even used the fig tree in teaching and preaching about his coming, about the parable of the fig tree. Jesus said this, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, yet that you know that summer is nigh. He even used the fig tree as an example. Watch Israel. Watch what's happening in the nation of Israel. Now we're going to come back to Mark chapter 11. So please hold your finger there. But go to the right a little bit to the gospel of Luke. Here's another example of Jesus using the fig tree in his teaching. And I believe it's an implication directly toward the nation of Israel. We're in Luke chapter 13. And we're going to begin reading in verse 6. We won't spend much time here, but I think it's worth looking at together. Luke chapter 13 and verse 6. He's just been teaching about the importance of repentance. Twice he said in these first five verses, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Then he says in verse 6, he spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon, and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, the man in charge of keeping the vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, the man who kept the, the fig tree gardener, he said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till, till I shall dig about it and dung it. I'll fertilize it and break up the soil. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Once again, I believe Jesus is talking about Israel here. Because they weren't producing fruit. He gives this illustration of a man who had this fig tree that was not producing fruit. And he said, just take it down. It's not worth having. It's cumbering the ground. It's wasting its space. And the man said, well, let's just give it a few more years. We'll give it a few more years. He said, well, let's give it another year there and see, see what happens. And it, if it doesn't bear fruit, then we're going to cut it down. And all this is really about the nation of Israel. God wanted to see fruit in Israel. Israel was a peculiar people unto the Lord. And he gave them, please don't miss this, he gave them every opportunity to respond to the truth. We talked about this another week. Jesus inspected the temple, not just this time he went into Jerusalem, but early in his ministry, when he began his ministry, he went to the temple, and you know what he found? He found that there were hypocrites. They weren't serious about their relationship to God. And finding no fruit, he cleansed it. He took a whip, drove the money changers out. Why? Because they were just living a life of pretense. Now he comes back to Jerusalem three years later at the conclusion of his earthly ministry. And what does he find? On his way to Jer first trip into Jerusalem, he goes and walks around. He looks at the temple. He looks at the city. He examines it, he surveys, he goes back out to Bethany. The very next morning, coming from Bethany toward Jerusalem, he sees a fig tree and he curses it. He goes into Jerusalem, drives the money changers out of the temple again. Why? Because there's still no fruit. 
They're just living a lie. They're just playing church. They're going through the motions. Goes back at the end of the day, back out to Bethany on his way back into the city the next day. The disciples notice this tree withered from the roots up, dead. They couldn't believe it. Why did he curse the fig tree and drive these money changers out? Because of their hypocrisy. He gave them an abundant time to produce fruit, but they did not. The leaves on the fig tree represent Israel's religious activity. That's what I believe it represents. This barren tree was symbolic of their apostasy as a nation. All through the ministry of Jesus, we find him, if not in Jerusalem, speaking to these Pharisees and scribes, these religious people, many times, preaching them, giving them the truth. But they rejected the truth. So Jesus is not just cursing a fig tree. He's cursing a nation. And just so we understand that, about 30 years after Jesus cursed that fig tree, after he died on the cross, after he went back to heaven, about 30 years later, the Romans under Titus conquered Israel, destroyed the city, destroyed the walls, destroyed the temple. And 2,000 years later, we stand here today and there is still no temple. You know why? Because God judged them. Why did he judge them? Because there's no fruit. God is not just interested in religion. He's interested in fruit and a relationship with him. So the first thing we see is this absence of fruit that that Jesus took issue with. The second thing we see is how it directly applies to the nation of Israel. But indirectly, it applies to all of us. To me, it's a, it's a warning that we be concerned not just on external things, but internal things. The reality of our relationship with Jesus Christ that produces fruit in our life, the fruit of the Spirit, the Bible says. Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit living within you is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness. It's not something we just learn from a book and learn how to mimic. It's something that comes out of a life where Jesus is ruling and reigning in our lives. There's one other thing in this passage I want to look at this morning, and that's not just the absence of fruit in the nation of Israel as applies to them But Jesus uses this to teach the lesson to the disciples about the role of faith. It's really, to me, kind of an interesting response. When Peter said, when Peter said to Jesus, behold, look at this, this tree. You're not going to believe this, Jesus. (laughs) But this tree that you cursed is withered from the roots up. And what did Jesus say in answer to him in verse 22? Have faith in God. That's an interesting response, isn't it? Have faith in God. And Peter was basically saying, how did this happen? And Jesus said, have faith in God. And if we look at these other verses, the remaining verses, as we will in the next few moments, Jesus took this opportunity. You've got to keep in mind that just a few days from right now, Jesus will be hanging On a cross. These are his last moments with his disciples. So Jesus takes this opportunity to talk to them about the matter of faith and prayer. You know what they saw? When they saw, I mean, I'm just thinking about those of us who live out, we're many of our people live out in the country, and if you you don't, you may have a tree or two around you. But if you looked at a tree this morning and it was perfectly healthy and you looked at it tomorrow morning and it's graveyard dead you it'd get your attention right you'd be thinking about that and you know what Jesus is saying this happened because of the power of God it wasn't because of a famine a lack of moisture too much heat not enough fertilizer he says it's because this thing happened as an expression of God's power it wasn't just wilted we've been gone for a week first thing that happened when we come in the house yesterday is we unload the car and I'm putting things away my wife has a pitcher of water 
in her hand. You know what she's doing? She's watering plants. <laughs> They're thirsty. It's been a week without a drink. This thing didn't just wilt, wilt a little bit. Or with, it, this thing was, was dried up from the roots. Listen, only God can make that happen. And so they asked Jesus, what, what caused this? And he said, have faith in God. Now stay with me this morning for a few minutes because I, wanna, I just want to derive a few practical lessons about prayer and faith from what Jesus said right here in the verses following. First one is this. Let's look in verse 23. For, whos, for verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain. Now I want to focus just for a moment on one word. And that's the word whosoever. Whosoever. You know the promise of prayer and the power in prayer is not just for Jesus. I mean, yes, Jesus could say this and it's going to happen. But he, Jesus said, this is, gentlemen, this is not just about me. And it's not just for apostles either. You say, well, I can see why the apostles would have prayer power. But Jesus said, it's not just for apostles or preachers. It's for everyone. He says, whosoever shall do this. I want to tell you, if you're a child of God today, if you're saved, these promises about prayer pertain to you. We, we need to see God at work. We need to see God's power at work. And God works in answer to prayer. We need, we need God to work in our country. We need God to work in our community. We need for God to work in marriages. We need for God to work in people that we care about and work with and live next to. But you know how God works? He works in answer to prayer. And everyone who knows the Lord has been given this powerful privilege, not just to complain about stuff, but to go to God about stuff. To talk to the God who can make everything out of nothing and talk to the God who can just speak the word and destroy in 24 hours a healthy plant. By the way, Jeremiah says that God can speak concerning nations to make them strong. He can speak concerning nations to make them weak. That's the God of the Bible. So we see that this promise of power and prayer is for everyone. That ought to encourage all of us in our prayer life. Challenges me. The second thing we see is not only the promises for everyone, but the second thing we see in this teaching of Jesus is the object of our faith. Simple in verse 22, have faith in God. Our faith in prayer is not in us. It's not even in our ability to pray. Our faith in prayer is in God. Have faith in God. Everything about true prayer is God-centered. It's not us trying to get our will done. It's trying to see God do His work. It's not faith in us. It's faith in God. Our faith is not in our ability to articulate a prayer. We have the example of Luke chapter 18 where Jesus said two men went up to the temple to pray and one prayed thus with himself. This was his prayer. It was really directed about in himself. And he said something like this, I thank thee, God, that I'm not as other men are. I'm not like this publican. I fast, I pray. His, his prayer was just very, probably beautiful to listen to, but it was meaningless. But there was another man there. This was his prayer, very simple. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And you know what? Jesus said, which one of these men do you think got their prayer answered? You know who it was? It was the one that really talked to God and prayed. He was God. God, prayer is not focused on us. Prayer is focused on God. You've heard me say this before, but I can remember when I was a new Christian. My wife and I had just gotten saved, 1975. Started going to a church, just very similar to this church. And I had this fear when I'd stand there. I knew it was coming time, the end of the service. The pastor always calls on somebody to pray. I had this fear that he might call on me to pray. You know why? Because I thought I couldn't pray like other people pray. My prayer wouldn't be right. My prayer wouldn't be good enough. My prayer wouldn't meet up to somebody's standard. But I'm going to tell you, that's not what prayer's about. Prayer's about talking to God. In simple, humble, heartfelt words, the object of our faith is God. 
We're trusting in Him. Jesus said there in verse 22, have faith in God. And then He says in verse 23, be that, He says, if, to, if you say to a mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. He just, he's just, he's a man is focused in prayer on trusting in God. You know what prayer is? Prayer ought to be trusting God to work according to his will. I have to confess, I'm sure I've prayed a lot of prayers in my life that were more about my will than God's will. I love the promise of John's epistle when he said, this is the confidence that we have in him. This is the confidence we have in God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he heareth us, we know we have the petitions that we desire of him. Prayer is not going to God and saying, God, I want this, I want this. Prayer ought to be saying, God, what do you want? What is, what is your will? Remember when Jesus taught the model of prayer? He says, pray after this manner, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In prayer, we ought to be praying for God's will. God is the object of our faith in prayer. Our desire in prayer, and I'm not saying I'm always there, but our desire is not just what we want. What does God want? I read someone recently where someone said it's the purpose of prayer is not to get man's will done in heaven, but to get God's will done on earth. You ever feel like maybe your prayers aren't being heard or aren't being answered? James said you ask and you don't receive because you ask to consume it upon your own lust. True prayer is seeking what would honor and please the Lord. It's agreeing with God. Asking according to his will. Now, I just want to insert this because uh, it needs to be said sometimes. You hear a lot of religious people saying that, that, that prayer is just name it and claim it. You know, whatever you want, just name it, claim it, God will give it to you. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible doesn't teach name it and claim it. The Bible says ask for God's will to be done. Ask for God to do what he wants to do. Now let me ask you this today before I go to my next thought. What is it that you would like for God to do? That you believe would be God's will to do? Now I'm not just inserting this thing about prayer and faith into a passage because it was on my mind. Jesus said it. When he cursed this fig tree and they said, how did you do this? And he said, have faith in God. God can do stuff. Well, what do you want God to do? Maybe you want God to work in your heart today. Say, I need, I need a relationship with God. I want God to work in my heart. Maybe you need God to work in your marriage. Maybe you would say, I need God to help me and, or help us in the training of our children. By the way, we all need God's help. We need God's help in this community. We need God to work His power in this community. Maybe you need for God to help you overcome some past failure. I'm telling you, God can do things that are in His will. The object of faith is God. It's not our faith, it's not our prayer, but it's God. Now Jesus used a statement here in verse 23 that really is, uh, gets my attention. Verse 23 when after he said, have faith in God, he says this in verse 23, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. Now that's an interesting statement, the significance of that statement, this mountain. Now, we don't know for sure. I'm assuming, I mean, he's in Jerusalem. He's talking about the Mount of Olives. He came, if you come from Bethany into the eastern side of Jerusalem, you'd come down from the Mount of Olives. Maybe he's talking about the Mount of Olives. But the question is, are we to take this literally or figuratively? Did Jesus do this? Was he trying to motivate his disciples to make a marked change in the landscape by sending the Mount of Olives to the Mediterranean Sea? Was that what he was trying to do? I don't think so. I think if he wanted to do that, he could have easily have done that. I would say he's using what we would call in our English language hyperbole. And that's you use an illustration to make a point. Like if, I, like if you say to a person, you're out of your mind. That doesn't mean they actually have removed themselves from their mind. Although it does seem that way sometimes. 
Or if you say you're making a mountain out of a molehill. I know what a molehill is. We have molehills in our yard. But I don't know that anybody would actually take a molehill and make Pike's Peak out of it, right? It's hyperbole. It's using, it's using illustration to help us understand a point. So when Jesus says, I believe that's what Jesus is saying here. Who's going to say to this mountain? He's, he's talking about something that's monumental, something that's major, something that's immovable, something that's strong, something that seems insurmountable, that's standing in the way. And Jesus used this illustration so that they would know there are going to be things in your... By the way, he's going to leave them. I keep coming back to this, but it's so important. In a few days, he will die on a cross. Then he's going after 40 days to ascend back to heaven. He's not going to be with them anymore. Up until this time, if they needed something, they could just go to Jesus. If they were in a storm and Jesus on the boat, what did they do? They just went to Jesus and said, Jesus, don't you care that we're about to go down? When they had a need, if there was a thousand people, that thousands of people need to be fed, Jesus fed those people, but Jesus is not going to be there. You know what he's saying? In the most difficult of situations, you can go to God in prayer. And God can take care of it. No matter how seemingly impossible it might be, have faith in God. All things are possible with God. So in this matter of teaching, he teaches them that this prayer is for everyone. This power in prayer. And he teaches them that the object of our faith is God. And then he teaches them there's nothing that's too difficult for God. And then I want to close with the last thing he mentioned about prayer. Look in verse 25. And when you stand, pray. Forgive. If you have ought against any, if there's anybody that you have a grudge against, anybody you've got an issue with, when you stand to pray, forgive that person that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Can God do anything? Yes. Can God move mountains, impossible situations? Yes. Is there anything that might keep God from hearing and answering our prayers? Yes. And what would that be? In a word, it would be sin. Specifically, he talks about unforgiveness. Not being willing to forgive people. Don't miss this last point that Jesus brings up. If we're going to have effective prayer lives, we have to deal with our sin. We have to deal with our personal sin. The sin that's in our heart. I was reminded this morning of the verse in the Psalms where the psalmist said this, it applies to what we're talking about. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Couldn't be more direct than that, could you? If I regard iniquity, yes, yes, God can do anything. Yes, every person who knows the Lord has this privilege of prayer where we can go to God for even the most difficult of situations. But Jesus said, just be reminded, when you stand to pray, if you've got something in your heart against somebody, you need to get it right. He's not talking here about salvation. He's talking about fellowship. He's talking about being able to trust God. He's talking about, he's talking about having a relationship with, with God where we can take our needs and problems to God. And he says, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them. Verse 26, but if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. You know what? I think most of us would have this in common. We don't want to have unforgiven sins between us and God, right? We don't want to have things that stand between us and God. And you know what God says? If you want that kind of fellowship, that kind of closeness with God, 
you've got to forgive others like you want God to forgive you. That's not the only time, by the way, this is mentioned. It's mentioned numerous times, and not by Jesus alone. In the epistles, Paul talks about this. Sin hinders our fellowship with God. I think most of us would know this, but we, we tend sometimes to categorize sin. Wow, that person's, you know, that person's addicted to this, and that person, he's squandering his money gambling, and that person, you know, is drinking, that person's doing that, those people. Have went. But you know what? And I'm not saying some sins are not more serious than the others. They are. But, but, any sin... Any sin, the sin of pride, the sin of unforgiveness, the sin of stubbornness and selfishness, any sin separates us from fellowship with God. Any sin hinders our prayer life. You know, you can hold grudges if you want to. But don't expect God to answer your prayers. You say, I don't think you ought to say that. Well, really, I'm not the one that said it. Jesus is the one that said it. You know why God does that? You say, well, God's just being hard on us. God, God's being too difficult. God's being so difficult. He just wants us to always keep our heart right with God. You know what? God doesn't do that to be difficult. He does it because it's good for us. It's good for us to have a clean heart. It's good for us to be right with God for others. It's good for us to forgive those who've wronged us. It's a powerful portion of scripture to me. First of all, it begins with Jesus cursing a fig tree and making it clear to us that what he was cursing wasn't just a fig tree. He was cursing hypocrisy. Acting like you're one thing on the other side, outside when you're not right on the inside and then then he teaches about prayer and the power and place of prayer and then he sort of to me links those two things by saying when you stand to pray which is something you do outwardly but you have unforgiveness which is something that is inward don't expect to get your prayers answered So you say, well, I'm just going to quit praying then. No, that's not the point. No, the point is, let's keep our heart right with God. Let's be honest with God. You know, when I, I mentioned earlier when I was a new Christian, I, I began to hear people make these statements. I didn't, I didn't have the vocabulary down yet. I hadn't been to church in years. They would make, use these phrases. I didn't understand them. And here was a phrase I would hear people use, don't, don't just play church. I thought, well, how do you play church? We've played a lot of things. I never played church. And then I'd hear this statement. You know, you need a, you need a 16-inch, or depending on who's pruning the pruning, a 16-inch or an 18-inch conversion. In other words, you need to get your religion out of your head and into your heart. You know, those little phrases, though, they mean something. That's what God's looking for. Young person, that's what God's looking for. He wants to have his way in our heart. Not just for young people, all of us. Now, if you're here today, and you would say in your mind, not to me, just to yourself, you and God, you would say, well, I, I feel like sometimes I'm like that fig tree. On the outside, I want things to appear a certain way, but it's not, really this, it's not really who I am on the inside. If there's no fruit, there's reason for concern. The good news is God loves you. Jesus died for you. He suffered on a cross that we could not be religious, that we could be saved, that we could be forgiven, that we could be born again, that we could be made new creatures. No religion. Our religion you go down this road, you go down this other road, you go down that road. Every road you go down, you're going to run across churches. All different shapes, sizes, flavors of religion. Listen, none of those churches can provide salvation. 
including this one. Only Jesus provides salvation. You must be born again, Jesus said. And if you're here today and you say, well, man, I don't know that it's ever happened to me, then talk to somebody about it. Talk to me about it. Talk to someone you trust. Say, show me in the Bible how I can know I'm going to heaven when I die. And you know what? The Bible clearly tells us what it is. And you know, even as Christians, though, even as people who are genuinely saved, we still have this tendency sometimes to be hypocrites or be hypocritical, maybe I should say. We want to act like things are okay when in reality they're not. But you know what the good news is? They can be right. They can be forgiven. We can be washed. We can be cleansed. We can be fruit-bearing Christians. Let's bow our heads together for prayer. Thank you for being so attentive today to God's word. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. In just a moment, our pianist will be playing. I want us to think about the message we've looked at today, this passage of Scripture. If nothing else pertains to you, This last thing we emphasis should pertain to all. Our prayer life. Have faith in God. The power of prayer, the promise of that power is to every person. But if we're going to be effective in prayer, we have to be forgiving and we have to keep our sins right with God. Our Father, as we pray today, we thank you. God, for this portion of Scripture, we thank you for your word. God, we want to take it seriously. This cursing of the fig tree, this obvious, miraculous, noticeable curse on hypocritical religion, on hypocrisy, We take it serious. We don't want to be like that. We know you were cursing Israel. But Lord, we we don't want to be like that. We want to be genuine, sincere, transparent Christians. And in this whole matter of prayer, my heart, Lord, is challenged today by your words. Help us today to take them to heart. 